So according to a Google search for the terms machine word origin, the word machine comes from the Greek mekos, meaning contrivance. I hope the irony of this intro is not lost on you guys. Um, departing from this etymological point, we can understand a machine as a contrivance or imagining incarnate, a particular vision of the world in one real abstraction. We can also think of the passage into machinic thought as a mode of thinking where the time for imagination, contrivance, or even ideology has come to a close. Strategy and tactics are both variations on a decision that has already taken place. So in some sense, the unity of that which might be called machinic consists in being a fundamentally second moment in a logical movement. This point is glaringly evident, for example, whenever we speak of the prospective further development of artificially intelligent machines. It would seem that there is a certain confusion latent in the coincidence of seemingly arbitrary inevitability and urgent necessity with regards to these developments. At the most articulate, we might encounter driving forces as an explanation, uh, whether the market, consumer demand, or the war machine itself, uh, in which case we're back at the moment of closure with regards to contrivance or imagining. In short, one would not be wholly mistaken in thinking that nobody really gets the impression that anybody else is asking why such perspective developments are announced or declared. While it would make sense to point spontaneously to a machinic instantiation of a structure, given the total perspective on various crises in contemporary critical theory, perhaps it would be more helpful to consider the possibility of the instantiation of machinic thought in its particularity itself. Like astronomical events, as we saw a few days ago, uh, some uncanny similarities to other presentations in mine, uh, we experience a fixity of relevant points for decision on a societal scale, like natural cycles, uh, dates and deadlines as it pertains to payments and international negotiations, or the interregnum that mediates one election to the next, this configuring them in a recursive loop with regards to their subject. While these points may be in themselves irrational or arbitrary, say, the turning of a new calendar year or fiscal quarter, they are not without real effects, of course. Uh, the problem is the indiscernibility of events with regards to a whole causing itself, or the spaces between ticks on a timeline, or alternatively, what happens in, so to speak, a black box. The idealism of the notion of synchronicity, taken from, among others, Carl Jung, consists in rendering the coincidence of the overlap of such points of deadlines as the coordination of multiple events against the background of one. This more or less poetic rendering of a convergence of elements, as in the thought of simultaneous global revolution, obfuscates the difference between the two. One might object that the absence of political change can be obviously accounted for with reference to the interests of the bourgeoisie and their exploitation of labor, but the presupposition or this attempt towards politicization, the abstract and impersonal imperatives of capital, capital excuse me, the whims of the bourgeois or bankers or the way desire is itself formulated here, along with the aforementioned reflections on the perspective development of increasingly intelligent machines. The presupposition of all this is often the idea that we live in a system, a specific version of imagining the way a whole might cause itself. Uh, popular for its paranoia and for its Elon Musk cosign is the idea that humanity or a whole universe lives in a simulation to which one might inquire like Sart on um, God, what the significance of this might be if we did or didn't. Uh, irrespective of such, total considerations, though. The assumption that we do, in fact, live in a system and as such formulate our desires, political demands and grievances in relation to such an entity is a pervasive feature of contemporary thought. But what do we mean when we speak of a system? Do we really live in one? Uh, like machine, the word system also comes from Greek origins. And again, I owe this wholly to just a Google search. Uh, sistema literally means with setup. An echo of the notion of a machine as a contrivance is obvious in relation to the setup to which the notion of a system is itself a supplement. But the supplementary relation of the notion of a system to that of a machine is double. In the first instance, system expresses a sort of totality that comes, so to speak, with or after the aforementioned setup, uh, sort of software to the hardware contrivance, a particular machine. In another, the with can be considered in a more constitutive sense, that is to say, there are no machines without the reference to a particular system that would function as its supplement. As such, the reference to machine and systems in general, the closing of imagination or thought latent in the passage into machinic thought is justified with reference to systems and imperatives that are systemic in nature. This reference, however, is itself nothing but the acceptance of the political horizon of particular machines. 
Um, while the notion of systematics, another Google search here returns the following definition, a branch of biology that deals with classification, nomenclature, taxonomy, arose out of the search for formalizing the unruliness of biological relations, as Harper just elucidated for us before, uh, and systems proper came to receive the most sophisticated treatment and subsequent development with the birth of cybernetics, as we again have seen, uh, the most fundamental formations of the notion of a system came to exist with the conception or birth of thermodynamics in the 19th century. Rarely considered are the fundamental tensions with regards to the constitutive boundary of a system, i.e. what might pass through it, and the premise that systems are independent wholes. There are at least three basic notions of a system revolving around the nature of a boundary. First, we've got open systems, which are synonymous with black boxes. The basic criteria is that energy and matter can pass through it. Then we have closed systems where energy but not matter can pass through it. And then we have isolated systems where neither energy nor matter can pass through the boundary. And from a purely logical standpoint, the first can be said to describe an inconsistency or a paradox because if the boundary is open, then is it there at all? The second, a redundancy with regards to the constitutive uh, closure or boundary in the closed system. And then the third isolated system is even in the words of uh, the theorists of thermodynamics, a hypothetical. Uh, from this, one can deduce a fourth option, which I'll get into a little more later, which is where energy, but uh, not, excuse me, matter, but not energy can pass through the boundary, uh, which is not a physical possibility, but is a logical one that is uh, latent in the duality of energy and matter with regards to the boundary. So much can be said about the application of thermodynamics as a social or political analogy. Uh, there's a text that I think is unsurpassed in this regard called Death Wall by Anna Tashira Pinto uh, that was in EFLUX a few years ago. Um, for the purpose of the question of systems themselves here, however, I want to note that the laws of thermodynamics run in an order such as to produce their own foundation retroactively in the sort of logical aspect of it. The zero with law of thermodynamics, the transitive property as it pertains to thermal equilibrium in thermodynamic systems, which is that if two systems are each in thermal equilibrium with the third system, they're in uh, thermal equilibrium with each other. Thermal equi equilibrium is one component uh, of thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, this was formalized long after the original three laws and is a sort of revisionist addendum that seeks to define temperature as an empirical parameter in a non-circular way without reference to entropy. There's a similar bait and switch latent in the another system theory concept of integrative levels of organization of being and strata uh, in the critical realism of Nikolai Hartmann. Yeah, he talks about like levels of strata, like matter, life, consciousness, culture, sort of like a pyramid or almost in the form of like Maslow, like growing out of it. Um, and in the thought of the levels of a system's organization or self-organization, emergence, phenomena emerge, uh, or do they, uh, in part from interactions of elements at a pre-existing level below, or at least that's the principle of it. At the same time, phenomena comprise whole entities themselves while also constituting part of an entity that emerges from this process of becoming at yet another level. In sum, there is something dubious in the application of the transitive property to entities that are themselves dynamic or inconsistent, and the fetishistic abstraction involved in these two examples of systemic logic saves independence at the cost of the instantiation of relation between interacting elements under control, as it were. Despite the popularity of what often feels like a painfully prescient proposition that we live in a society of control today, Gilles Deleuze, uh, the above conception of interactivity blurs the line between activity and passivity itself while still maintaining the former idea or notion as to make this appearance of control possible. Even the notion of positive in contrast to negative feedback, which might serve as a heuristic for imagining a point at which the system explodes or boils over and maintains a fundamental coincidence of those elements which are under control and out of control, respectively. And usually there's the very conservative uh, example in the pejorative sense given of like a crowd control and uh, a riot or a stampede, something, whether humans or uh, animals, goats running off a cliff, they always talk about this, systems theorists. However, independence is only conceivable as a gap in hearing within the conceptual space of dependence or like inequality within equality or unconsciousness within consciousness, for example. And so my thesis effectively is that a system 
In short, stands for a conceptual effacement of this gap or incompleteness of totality. Commonsensically, we could also speak of a system as a protocol for a particular uh, procedure, or even synonymous with procedure itself. The obligatory presentation of CVs, resumes, speaker bios, cover letters is one such positing of a system. Central to this system is a particular form of abstraction as it pertains to the independence of an individual and their relation to the work they pursue. In other words, the two things that are effectively demanded in any job application are already implied in the very act of doing so. For example, that you want the job and that you are able or qualified to do the job. Uh, it's well known in theory world that Jacques Lacan remarked that a madman who thinks he's a king is no crazier than a king who thinks he's a king. Identification like this is imaginary, so to speak. But what then do we make of the fact that we are injuncted in a sort of conflation of survival and symbolic existence or need and on the one hand and demand and desire on another, um, or, or the effacement of that which might be socially necessary beyond our particular whatever we want, particular subjective wills. What, what do we make of the fact that we are uh, injuncted to assume these imaginary identifications at every turn of our lives, perhaps all the more imaginary insofar as they are taken to merely designate a symbolic position, sort of disavowed in this way. Uh, this logic has an obverse side in relation to the Lacan reference above that there is an objective dimension to one's identification as an administrative assistant, teacher, or even with your own name. It is also telling that the most common spontaneous explanation for the necessity of these fairly recent phenomena in the history of the organization of labor um, is that they serve as a buffer or screening test on madness itself as if there could be some criterion. And it's well known that the American answer to this is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM, but it's less commonly known that the DSM was itself conceived as a sort of expansive form of socio-cybernetics. One contrast to this reality is the fact that in the previous two centuries, most revolutionaries notably identified with noms de guerre and noms de plume, uh, war names and pen names, uh, in contrast to the consistency of dis and distribution and preservation of identity or naming in everything from the domain of labor to the format of Facebook profiles, as we heard earlier a bit, uh, to blue check marks on uh, Twitter, to the registration of a citizen as a number in the social security system, to name only a few examples. Today, popular music, as well as some internet avatars, are domains where one can adopt new names, pointing to their ambiguous revolutionary potential, as Mark Fisher observed. But if a system is what it does, as the famous systems theorist Stafford Beer said, uh, what a system, excuse me, uh, what a system does is grounded in the presupposition of a purpose, namely one's spontaneous interpretation, never without ideology, of what exactly is being done. Uh, the multiplicity of functions embedded in a smartphone perfectly exemplify the confluence of one single machine with a system, a confused conflation of action and purpose, cause and effect, and becoming. Any critique of this uh, as a Luddite position or uh, allusion to the idea to that idea is uh, severely outmoded in the face of the ubiquity and individualized distribution of machines, I claim. It's also kind of boring in 2021 to ask, but what of humanity such that we are complicit in the constant use of these machines. There's a difference between those who design, create, and even desire to bring such machines into existence and those who are more indifferent or subject to such prospects. A system assumes regularly interacting parts. That is to say, imagine, for example, already established military bases trying to call each other. This is again the passage into the secondary logic of machines, but at a higher point that spearheads whatever one might mean by a system itself and is exempt from its internal logic. Uh, there's a reason that Marxism and psychoanalysis, which uh, both of which I affirm, uh, aim each in their own way at free association as opposed to association as such, which theoretically speaking must be conceived as a priori unfree. Uh, in this regard, there is no necessity of conceiving a dynamic of regular interaction between producers and consumers, machines or otherwise. The producer and consumer point is sort of at the heart of Marx's own critique of political economy. The persistence of such an economist or even machinic notion of unity, or again, relation, though, often resulting from politicization of the intimate domain of economy itself, exists even in the way people talk about relationships today as open, i.e. polyamorous, closed, monogamous, exclusive, 
One could go further along the lines of taxonomy of systems proposed above in order to radicalize the fetishistic confluence of machine and the system it may sustain or operate in the reality of uh, couples and propose also an isolated relationship, such as those cognitive behavioral therapists who like to talk about having a relationship with yourself too, or even in the expansion of a fourth logical option pertaining to the energy matter duality uh, from thermodynamics as it pertains to the boundary of a system. Uh, the fourth option I was mentioning where matter but not energy could pass through a border, a sort of impossibility. We could have an impossible relationship, one that goes on and on despite all reasons to the contrary, having effectively been reduced to a purely formal connection to pride about energy or substantial content in terms of the earlier presentation, kinosis. Uh, from the intimate sphere of our lives to the news we read about the Federal Reserve raising interest rates, the same applies to the equally popular lifestyle topic of the necessity of open communication. We could also imagine something like closed communication, its most extreme forms, ghosting or cutting off diplomatic relations, which no doubt sends a message, isolated communication, the other side of having been ghosted or blockaded, not unlike Gaza, for example, uh, impossible communication where words effectively fail and yet the truth of one speech with another can be found. In this sense, open communication is nothing but the retroactive product of the fantasy of having reached consensus or systematization. We might say those puppet governments in the third world tasked with implementing structural adjustments or other similar projects of basically colonial nations are a good example of the effective maintenance of open communication. To be clear, the problem, simply put, is not first and foremost communication, that which communication would presuppose, connection, association, relation, regular interaction, relation between elements or entities that would not affect their very constitution, the very constitution of each of them. Many have already pointed out that within the system we call the market that operates in the principles of supply and demand, it would seem insufficient to simply put down the most ubiquitous and addicting of commodities like an iPhone, uh, here, the notion of a system intrudes deepest into our minds insofar as the void imagined in the absence of these machines can only be rendered antithetically, but nonetheless in the same form. Uh, there's a product out there called the Light Phone. I heard this from another Lacanian guy named Dwayne Roussel, so this is not my own idea or reference, but uh, promises an antidote to the iPhone, allowing the user to pay the same price for a phone with only the basic functionality of a flip phone. <laughs> Uh, and one could go even further here, the way amendments function in the US Constitution, chipping away at particular content but never modifying the form is effectively the same thing conceptually. Progress in this regard cannot be thought as a wholesale change or destruction of the course of history, but as a serial repetitions of moments, ticks for and against a pros and cons list subject to endless revision, but without decisive action upon it. Is this the horizon of the democratic notion of history? Perhaps the logic of our future would seem intuitively against such a technological conception of history, which may as well coalesce with the liberal version of an arc of history that had reached its furthest developed articulation in the oration of Barack Obama, but has now been brought yet further by Joe Biden's very quick turnaround declaration that America is back a few weeks ago. Uh, but there are certain junctures where knowledge and truth are opposed in a way that democratic secular reason including systems theory, arguably cannot account for. The very possibility of the logic of uh, nuclear anti-proliferation against the background of actual destruction or annihilation already indexes another way beyond the serial advancement of knowledge uh, against what some reactionaries might insist and the adherence to protocol or the logic of a system. Like mutually assured destruction, what if we understood the way out, so to speak, of our system thematic entrapment in machines, not through even smarter technological development from phones to cities, but instead reframed our systematic entrapment in machines as at heart a pretty stupid predicament, in which we are duped, uh, not unlike Descartes in the face of his sort of hypothetical evil deceiver at the most radical moment of his second meditation. Jacques Lacan once warned that those who are not duped err. It is precisely in the urge towards systematization, I am claiming here that one errs, and for what it's worth, Lacan associates the systematizing with both Baruch Spinoza and the paranoia of Judge Schreber, uh, for whom the reality of the evil deceiver, or we might say ideology, is actual to the point of negating its own ontological status as virtual. Perhaps systems uh, can be taken to be working best when we don't see or perceive them to be a determinant of our situation at all, if it only were always uh, that easy. I, uh, I could conclude here, I have a small postscript, but I'll leave it uh, instead for Q&A time, thank you.